This is the Before You Read lecture on the pastoral epistles, otherwise known as 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. And this Before You Read lecture will be a bit longer than the previous Before You Read lectures, and it will be a bit uh, it will be formatted a bit differently as well because these letters are typically treated together um, as the pastoral epistles and because of the letters written by Paul or attributed to Paul in the New Testament, it is the pastoral letters that scholars have come to doubt most consistently um, their authorship, whether or not they're actually written by Paul. And so it's important for us to treat them as a group and to treat some of the critical issues that have led scholars to so frequently doubt their authenticity from the, the hand of Paul. And so to begin with, just a brief orientation to these three letters. Um, it wasn't until uh, about the 18th century that these letters were known as the pastoral epistles and treated as a group. Um, up to that point in the early church, these were just part of the core the Corpus of Paul, and often um, people would quote uh, people writing in the early church would quote from the pastoral epistles without mentioning if it was from first first Timothy or second Timothy. Just they would say the apostle says, and then fill in the blank. And so, um, probably for the last two hundred years, uh, the authenticity of these letters has been seriously doubted. Um, it started with with authenticity of first Timothy, and then eventually it came to cover all three um, of the pastoral letters. And so there are some broad scholarly tendencies that you need to be aware of uh, that sort of undergird this increasing doubt about the authenticity of these letters. The first is that um, the authentic Paul, that Paul that we can for sure, or at least with confidence, um, uh, identify as actually having written letters, um, this is often equated with genuine Christianity. And so if we can show that the pastorals were written by somebody else, in the late first or even in the second century, then um, they they no longer represent sort of genuine New Testament Christianity is the assumption that some make. The other is that authorship equals authority. And what I mean by that is that it is because it is written by Paul that it should be authoritative. And you can see that that's actually not the case. That's not a necessary assumption that um, because it's in the New Testament canon, because the early church has come to these writings consistently as a source of its life and ministry, um, that it would still be an authority, even if one could show without a doubt that it wasn't written by Paul. And thirdly, uh, probably the most significant scholarly tendency is to treat all three of these letters as if they were a group, almost as if they were written at the same time and by the same person. And it is probably that tendency that I most want to call into question in this lecture um, and ask the question, how would we understand the pastoral epistles differently if we treated each one of them independently, if we tried to identify and discuss and wrestle with each text independently, rather than sort of lumping them all together and treating them all together. That's sort of a, a basic question for this lecture. So what are some of the issues with the pastoral letters that have caused scholars, um, it, at least in the last 200 years, to doubt that they were written by Paul? Well, there are a number of issues that, that scholars have raised. The first is that it's, it's difficult to place them in in Paul's career, meaning it's hard to place them in the narrative of Acts and in the what we know about his letters. Um, it's hard to fit them chronologically into those uh, those sources. In addition, there are issues related to style, and uh, admittedly, a lot of this has to do with the Greek text. So it's not something that may appear to you readily if you only are reading the English. But at the level of the Greek text, there are issues with vocabulary. There are issues with the way that the words and sentences are put together, um, so much so that scholars have said, look, th these letters seem to be using different vocabulary and even different grammatical forms than we see in the other Pauline letters. Now, once again, notice that that's trying to treat all three of them together rather than um, each of them independently. Thirdly, uh, the nature of the opponents imagined in each uh, of the writings is is, is somewhat problematic. Um, scholars would say these opponents or these people that, that Paul is dealing with in opposition uh, represent heresies or false teachings that are maybe more at home in the second century than they are in the middle of the first century, which is when Paul was originally writing. Related to that, there are issues related to church organization 
organization. Um, and so scholars would say that the church seems to be more organized, more hierarchical. It has very clearly established roles for bishops and deacons and for widows and so forth. And um, the, the, the assumption here is that uh, usually you start with freer organization and then as the as a movement progresses it becomes um, more and more rigid and hierarchical that's an assumption that others have challenged um, but in any case scholars look to the pastoral epistles and say it seems as though this church is more developed and it's more developed uh, similar to what we know of the church from the second century and then uh, finally theology and ethics there are some common Pauline ideas and terms that are missing from the pastoral epistles. Uh, things like the justification by faith or even uh, references to the cross uh, seem to be not as apparent as they are in other um, writings. Others suggest that there's a there's a, a, a higher Christology, um, higher or more developed notion of Jesus's divinity. There's a, there's a different regard for the outside world and uh, perhaps uh, most significant for some scholars is that the treatment of women in the pastoral epistles seems to be quite different from the treatment of women in some of Paul's uh, more authentic letters or the seven undisputed letters that scholars recognize. And so those are the sort of broad issues that, that scholars have, have raised about these three writings as a whole and about whether or not they were written by Paul. Again, like I said, most scholars, most critical scholars um, will come to a conclusion, something like that that you see in the, the Fortress Commentary of the Bible New Testament, where Deborah Krauss says that these books were likely compiled in the second century, written several generations after the death of the historical Paul. The pastoral epistles represent a part of the early church's interpretation of Paul. So the pastoral letters are interpretations of Paul. They are memories of Paul, in other words. And Joanna Dewey, who writes the entry on the pastoral epistles um, uh, in the Women's Bible Commentary, says this, The evidence that Paul did not write the pastorals is overwhelming. The style is not typical of the authentic letters of Paul, but rather of a more general Hellenistic literary Greek. The theological concerns and vocabulary differ substantially from Paul's. Finally, it is exceedingly difficult to fit the letters into any biography of Paul. You can see how both of those uh, sentiments sort of reflect what I what I just got done explaining about some of the major problems with the pastoral epistles. And so as you engage this, I just want to raise a few questionable assumptions that maybe will help you make your own decisions about how scholars are talking about these things. The first is that Acts in Paul's letters give us all that we could possibly know about Paul's ministry and mission. Now, clearly that's not the case. We know that Acts leaves out parts of of Paul's life, and that there are parts of Paul's letters that don't necessarily find a corollary in the book of Acts. And so, so it's very, it's it's at least possible that um, the pastoral letters were written in a time that neither Acts nor the other letters of Paul would indicate. And that's a that's a possibility. It doesn't mean that they are automatically after Paul died. Um, the second sort of questionable assumption is that there is a unity or a coherence to Paul's thinking in the other letters. That is to say that there is a core to Pauline theology. Now, many scholars would tell you this, and, and, and the problem is, is that they would argue about what that core is. And so um, we have to remember that this core is the construction of interpreters. They are constructing this core through interpretation. And so we have to deal with that, um, that, that maybe we could disagree with what that core is, and that that core being used to judge these other letters is itself problematic. The third questionable assumption is that the pastorals were written together and all fall together. Fourthly, uh, there is uh, no variety among the three letters. That's another questionable assumption. And so we can question whether or not there is variety. And in fact, I would encourage you as you read these three letters to really focus on how they are unique and different from one another and how they are similar. Um, and then finally, um, the, the, there's the assumption that these are not real letters and that they're not shaped by the context or by the recipient. Um, again, as you read these letters, think about, is there a situation that you can imagine? Is there a, is there a group that you can imagine that, that an author would be responding to, or are these all in fact literary, imaginary situations? Again, I think that we could have a question, we could have a conversation about that, and, and I encourage you to read it in that way. 
what I what I will do now is is present briefly um, an outline of First Timothy, an outline of Second Timothy, and an outline of Titus. So here first is the outline of First Timothy. You can see that it it starts with a salutation. Um, it starts right away with correcting um, uh, deviance or or improper teaching, and then the bulk of it from two one through six nineteen is is what I've titled respectable behavior in the household of God. Um, and you can see how that how that goes through a number of of different elements and aspects and then it closes in 620 through 6 uh, through 21. Here now is an outline of 2 Timothy. Again it begins with a salutation. Um, in 1, 3 through 18, you can see that there, there is this call for Timothy to reinvigorate his commitment to the gospel. There's a prayer. There's a word of encouragement. There are examples given. And then um, then there is this, this bit about spreading the gospel in 2, 1 through 4, 18. Um, that is met then by 4... Uh, for, with the closing in 419 through 22. Now you can see that even in this outline, there's not a lot of commonality between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, um, particularly the interest in Timothy as a person and his struggle to remain committed to the gospel and the demonstration of the gospel through suffering and the need for uh, perseverance. These aren't at all present in 1 Timothy. Um, and so even though these are two letters addressed to Timothy, they are very different from one another. And finally, uh, here's an outline of, of Titus. And you can see once again, it opens with a salutation. Here we have uh, some instruction about leaders, elders, bishops, um, and then a warning about rebellious people. And then in 2, 1 through 15, much like that section in 1 Timothy about, the, about behavior in the household of God, we have instructions for different people within the church. Um, in 3, 1 through 11, there's instructions about behavior towards outsiders. And then um, finally, there's this closing in 3, 12 through 15. And so you can see Titus is more like 1 Timothy than 2 Timothy is. But even Titus and 1 Timothy have some important differences just in terms of their outline and structure. As I close this lecture, um, I, I really encourage you to reconsider the idea of the pastorals as a corpus as a group of three letters that were written at the same time. And I, I ask you, is it helpful to think about that? Is it helpful to think about the pastorals as one group or or is that problematic? Um, and um, as you analyze these letters, um, as you read these letters, three things to sort of keep in mind to consider where there are similarities and differences. First, um, what is the nature of the controversy or the opponents addressed in each one? Second, what do you notice about church organization and offices in each one? And third, what do you notice about theology and ethics in each letter? These are three things to sort of focus your reading um, as you approach these three letters. Thank you for your time. I, I hope that this lecture has given you a broad introduction to the, the pastorals, and I hope as well that it's raised some questions questions for you that we can discuss further in class. Thank you for your time.